So I'm so excited to welcome Roxana Kasim Kara, National Director of Marketing and Communities with Ronald McDonald House Charities of Canada. Roxana, welcome. Thank you so much. It's so lovely to be here, Tanya. Terrific to chat with you. So much to cover. So we're going to launch right in. Now, before we talk specifically about the role that you're in right now, I know you sort of started very traditionally on the CPG side of marketing. Can you talk a little bit about your journey um, to become a nonprofit marketer and what that was like for you? Of course. Yes. So you're exactly right. I did start my journey um, in CPG after my MBA and worked for some fantastic um, CPG companies that honestly, I really loved my, my time there. I worked with really smart people who were always pushing me. Um, I had a lot of opportunity to learn. Uh, and it was, it was great. I just found it was a real community. Um, but then I found, you know, after I'd been there for about 10 years, when my son was born, you know, naturally I had a little bit of time off work and that helped me sort of reassess where I was and kind of took me out of that day-to-day fray so I could really think about what I wanted in life. And I realized I just wanted kind of a more purpose-led career um, for myself. And, you know, purpose-led means different things to different people. Um, For me, it really meant having a clear purpose that I was working towards. Um, and, you know, and that led me to Ronald McDonald House Charities. It was a, a bit of a journey. I had to get very clear on, you know, what my strengths were, what I wanted to contribute, what environment I wanted to be working in. You know, I was coming with marketing strategy skill sets and I wanted to make sure I was using that in whatever I, role I moved to. So I was lucky and blessed enough to find a role with Ronald McDonald House Charities and I've been there ever since. Oh, that's, that's incredible. I mean, we were talking a lot about, you know, the mission of Ronald McDonald House Charities. What, what was it specifically about the mission here that connected or that you felt connected to your purpose? Well, you know, I think having had just a son at that time, he's now 10. Um, but at that time, I think family really resonated with me. And, and I think finding out that, you know, obviously, if he had a cold, even I would have run to be with him, dropped everything to run to be with him. And knowing that families had children with life threatening illnesses, that they couldn't be together, you know, or close to the hospital. It was just an issue I had no idea about before. Um, and really, my aim in life is really to um, give marginalized populations a voice, make them feel seen, heard and valued. And it really felt to me that in Canada, this was an issue that wasn't um, wasn't necessarily at the forefront. So helping advance that cause, raise understanding, awareness and giving so that these families could stay at Ronald McDonald houses, which were steps away from their critically ill child, was really, uh, really important to me. And then also, of course, being having the chance to use um, my marketing, my strategy skills, working again with very smart people and being able to do, you know, kind of that long-term marketing planning and having the value of marketing really appreciated was also, of course, a big plus. And so, so that touches on, I think, where we, where we want to go for the majority of, of today's chat. So tell us a little bit about what marketing is like on the nonprofit side, because I know on the nonprofit side, you have sort of this metric or this North Star of maximizing the donor dollar. Um, What is the role of marketing and sort of what have you uncovered, um, you know, since moving to the nonprofit side that that you can share with us? So that's a great question, Tanya. It is true. There is really a focus on the donor dollar. um, And I think that comes from how charities have to report and what donors are focused on. Um, And that is great, right? That is great from a point of efficiency and effectiveness. I think every charity gives them an incentive to work that way. But it can be challenging um, and sometimes debilitating, right? It can really lead to um, a a fear of failure because you just don't have that margin to try new things. Um, And, you know, I remember I was talking to the CEO of Canada Helps the other day, and she said, I've never met a sector that's more scared to fail. Because they just can't, they can't do that if they're always looking to maximize and optimize the donor dollar. And the problem is that means they can't learn and evolve. So I think charities are doing great things in that work and they're really scrappy and doing amazing things with the, with the funds they have. But I wish that there was, you know, more uh, value put on that so they could, they could be able to try new things. And marketing is one of those things, you know, I think for a lot, of years, marketing was, you know, kind of a dirty word in the charity sector. I wouldn't say anymore. 
Um, but I would say for a long time, it was communications. It was fundraising. Even when I was looking for a career, when I said marketing, a lot of people looked at me sideways and said, you know, you might want to just rethink that. And, you know, do you really want to be fundraising? And I said, well, no, I want to create an engaged group of customers, donors who are, you know, engaged in the brand, which is the charity and mm -hmm. want to support it and want to champion it. To me, that's marketing. That's what I've done throughout my career. That's what I want to continue to do. But that thinking was very new at the time. Now, I'm happy to say it's much more, um, well, it's more integrated and woven in to the landscape, the charity landscape. But I do think that focus on the donor dollar still hasn't led to as much uh, a value put on marketing um, as I would love to see in the sector. Well, and it's, it's interesting because as we were first talking about this, uh, it's not dissimilar to the tension that you hear in traditional marketing of this sort of divide between being, you know, a performance marketer or sort of a direct response marketer where it's all about, you know, how many sales get driven mm -hmm. and then being a brand marketer where, you know, it's much more sort of... Uh, uh, airy and it's more focused on long term and others. And I, I think there's a big melding of those two worlds in marketing in general. And it sounds like this is something that that you're also experiencing as as integral to to the growth of the nonprofit space. Yeah, I I would totally agree. I think I think maybe exactly as you said, you know, years ago it was thought of as sort of airy fairy, you know, brandy. If you have the dollars, it's something good to look at. But right. Wouldn't it be not safe? Yeah. It was, a, yeah, exactly. It was a nice to do. Now, I think charities are realizing it's a must do, you know, and I think part of that is exactly what's happened in the brand world, you know, where there used to be one or two key brands that sort of own the marketplace. And now it's a proliferation of small brands who are taking share. You know, it's the same thing with charities. 20 years ago, there were, you know, five times fewer charities asking. Um, so you could really say this cause is really important, contribute to this cause. Um, now you can't really say that because every cause is important and you know there is so much need. So you really, I think, have to be relevant to your donor um, and make them feel part of it so that they, they feel engaged and they want to support you versus everybody else out there. Well, and I think when we were Talking about that, you mentioned, you know, you have your family is medicine campaign. And I know that was something which uh, was important to your organization because it sort of went beyond the, hey, isn't our cause great? You know, support our cause sort of perspective. And it went much deeper in, in how to connect specifically with Canadians. But can you tell us a little bit about that campaign? You know, how you got to that, what, what that experience was? Sure. Yeah. Thank you um, for asking that. So I think that, you know, family is medicine is another step in our evolution to become a cause brand um, at Ronald McDonald House Charities. And that's really the evolution I'm talking about, moving from just a charity to really being a cause that Canadians can identify with. I really do feel that it's important for marketers to understand what's happening in culture, whether you are at CPG, whether you are in telecom, whether you are in tech, whether you are in charity. Um, and you can really only be relevant to donors if you're relevant in their lives. So when we were looking at our family as medicine platform, we really thought, you know, what is relevant right now? We, we, were, we were set to launch it, frankly, in 2020, March 2020. That ended up being not such a great time. <laughs> um, and we went back in to do some research to say, is this relevant right now? Is this something Canadians want to hear about? Um, and what came back to us is that family is more relevant than ever. So, you know, I think in the last year, year and a half, either you've been really close in four walls with your family um, and you know how important it is and you've found pockets of time that maybe you didn't have and are having interactions you didn't have, or you're away from your family and you're really, really realizing how important that is. Um, so family is very relevant. And so we felt that our campaign felt relevant and it felt some, like something Canadians, you know, people could champion. Um, and that's how we came up with that platform and went ahead with it. And what was the role, you know, either for this campaign or more generally for you, what is the role of social media for the Ronald McDonald House Charities? So that's a great question. So um, I'll say we have a very engaged. So the way Ronald McDonald House Charities works, um, I lead up marketing and communications for the, uh, the Canadian chapter, which is sort of the foundation of giving 
for the the chapters we call them across the country which are the houses that are across the country the houses and the family rooms they're their own organizations charitable organizations and we work very closely with them so it's a federated model um, those houses and family rooms have very engaged followers because they're often frequently you know people families who have stayed at the house one in four canadians have either stayed at a house or family room or know somebody who has. And so they have very close relationships with them and they stay in touch with them. And those families often become the ones who are spreading the word. Hey, we used the house. We didn't even know, you know, what they'll say to us is we didn't even know it existed till we needed it, um, which is a, a very true feeling, I'd say, across the world, even for Ronald Donald houses. So um, engaging them in social and having them spread our message has been uh, really, really important and something we continue to do through the Families Medicine campaign. So, you know, that campaign is really all about when families stay together, sick children get stronger. So really looking at the role in a family in contributing to the circle of care for a family, for a, for a sick child. Um, and our families have been the ones who've stepped up and said, yes, you know, family was medicine for our child, helped through that healing journey. Um, and a campaign is only a campaign and a tagline unless you have real people behind it. And social media is the way we've been able to get real people to chime in their voices. The 20,000 families we support a year are the ones who are really, you know, sharing that message with Canadians more broadly. Yeah, no, that's, and that's, what an incredible statistic of one in four families. I mean, that, that really means that pretty much everyone you're speaking to will have some tie to, you know, to, to what you're doing. That That's really incredible. Thank you. Yeah, it's one that's honestly amazing to me. Um, just just that we have reached that many families and that many people know about Ronald McDonald houses. And I'd say, you know, 40 years ago when we started, it wasn't as prevalent as it is, but, you know, it's really become more and more families have used it over the years. And now anytime I speak to a group, there's always a few in there who said, yes, my cousin used it, my neighbor used it, my friend used it, I used it. And that was one of the genesis behind the Families Medicine campaign is to bring everyone into the cause, whether they've used a house, whether they know somebody who has, or whether they're just, you know, a champion for families. So, I mean, that's that's an incredible opportunity. And, you know, you've also sort of talked about, you know, how important it is to, to really lead with the relevancy to culture. So how do you, you know, there's, we've had a pretty remarkable last 12 to 15 months, um, remarkable in, in, you know, positive and negative ways, of course. Um, how do you innovate with so much competing for attention and knowing that, you know, you don't have the budgets in your current role that you might have had when you, you know, started out on the CPG side? Can you talk a little bit about your approach to innovation? Sure. Yeah, so I think, yeah, like you said, you know, we've been saying it at RMHC, as we call Paul McDonald Houses, that really this time has been a time machine almost for innovation and some of the things we've been working on because um, the need for them has become so much more critical when you look at some of, some of the traditional ways that we brought people into the, the cause that aren't available anymore, like in-person events, like fundraisers, things like that. Um, so it's really forced us to think differently. Um, and what I will say has been my approach from the beginning, and more particularly now, when I reflected, is really uh, the importance, the really the, the criticalness of being clear on objectives, strategies, and approach before you proceed to innovation. I think, you know, and aligning to that as a team. Um, and that's really just about defining the sandbox you want to play in before you go and have fun. You know, lots of times we're so excited. Innovation, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's the fun part is the innovation. And I can't tell you throughout my career how many workshops and seminars I've been part of where you've got the sticky notes and you've got the Sharpies and you're going ahead and you're coming up with all these big ideas, but you haven't really defined what the sandbox is. Um, and what that leads to is, you know, without that, you have no criteria or filter to select or prioritize all the great ideas that come up. Or you move ahead with one or two based on whatever subjective criteria you have that day. And that leads to a spin cycle. You know, it's long, it's unproductive, it's frustrating, it's demotivating for people who are moving ahead with projects and then, you know, have to kind of push back as you pull back because you're saying, well, is this the right thing? So 
really defining what you're trying to do and being rigorous on that is really important. And what I mean by that, you know, for example, if I'm looking at a, a charitable lens, you know, for, of course, we're always looking to drive awareness, understanding and giving. But which of the three is it for, you know, for this specific program? Who are we looking to do that with? Why have we chosen that, you know, that space to play in and being very clear um, on that piece and then looking at that from a quarter to quarter basis. So, for example, you know, I can think of this quarter, you know, as we're looking at it, one of the things that, you know, we were looking at is, okay, well, as the landscape is changing, as COVID is sort of progressing, you know, there's been a lot of leadership changes in some of the organizations we work with. Um, some of the partners might have priority changes. So how does that affect what we're doing? You know, is there maybe a need to entrench, solidify the base of support we have, steward um, the people that we're working with, do a re-engagement um, with some of our donors and our key partners in our, in our cause um, before we move ahead? You know, if we hadn't stopped and sort of noticed, looked around and noticed that and aligned to that as a team, we could have moved ahead with XYZ projects, but not done the base work that mm. leads to that. So that doesn't sound as sexy and fun for sure. <laughs> but I do find once you do that, once you sort of ground in what your objective strategies and approach are, then it's actually a lot faster to innovate because then you've set that sandbox, you know, you go through, you can, you can look at what our ideas fit within here. And it's also a lot easier to sell them through to your stakeholders because then you've gotten their alignment on, on where you're going and why you're going there. And then the ideas they know fit into that, into that frame. And, and what is the role of data and insights, either when you're setting up the sandbox or as you're progressing and sort of rolling out your strategy? Uh, so I think everything starts from there. I mean, yes, I think everything starts from there. I think it starts from insights, um, for sure. And then analytics help to either refine it or tweak it or it might reveal a new insight to you. So, you know, sometimes it's an insight just about you know, the landscape, like I talked about now. Sometimes it's looking at, you know, your, your giving stats and noticing a group that's maybe underrepresented um, and, and, you know, looking at sort of a segmentation and going that way. And then sometimes it's doing analytics on the back end of a program and finding, okay, this part worked, but this didn't work. So let's tweak this moving forward. So it always plays a role. Sometimes it's at the front end, sometimes, but it, I mean, it's always kind of leading in at the front end, but then we always do it at the back end too, because I find that that's where you kind of get the tweaking or the optimizing or finding out what didn't work and why. Right. And so that you can then go on and continuously improve. Yes, exactly. Because then otherwise you sort of get stuck in doing, you know, the same thing over and over or your you're, you are optimizing, but you don't know how to optimize, you know, right. necessarily. So that can also be, you know, lead to a spin cycle and I, and that can be long and unproductive. So really doing those tweaks, it, I, I find it, you know, really, really helpful. Um, and just really just knowing your audience, frankly, can be so, so helpful in figuring out, okay, what do you need to do next? How do you need to do next? And essentializing what you need to do. Do I need to be on TikTok? Do I need to look at, you know, different platforms? Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. You know, who are my audiences? What is their giving behavior? Who am I trying to, who am I trying to reach and why? Yeah. And I think, I think describing it as little tweaks is so important because I think, you know, the, the worst thing you can do other than not measure at all is measure so infrequently that when you go to measure, you have so much vested in proving that it went well, or, you know, you've so much riding on this one readout that I think it can be harder to look at it dispassionately and objectively, right? Because now it's, you know, now it's a pass fail sort of grade. Yes. And, you know, you're exactly right, Tanya. And the truth is often it's not a pass fail. You know, like, and this is the funny thing when you look at the data, you never be that, right? It's it yes. should always be about learning. Yeah. Yeah. If, if it is a pass fail, then you really haven't done your research leading in, right? Or something huge has changed, which, you know, we've also seen. Um, but often it is little tweaks and it's digging in to find what those little tweaks are, you know, formulating a theory and then working from there. Because I, I find that sometimes it's getting the research and then sitting with the research and then going back three months later and looking at and looking at it again and three months later and looking at it again, 
because sometimes it's so easy to sit in big presentations or, you know, pull the data and then sit with it once, you know, think you've got it, check, check, off you go. But then you might come back and say, well, you know, wait, what, what about this little nugget? It might be a little nugget, but it might really convert um, into donations or what you're looking at moving forward. Yeah, no, that's, that's terrific advice. Um, so a, a nice big one for you. Uh, as you look back at your career, you know, and now you've, you know, you've had a, had some different roles and some different pathways. There's always this theme of marketing, but what do you view as the single most influential decision in your career? Oh, that's such a good one. Gosh. Um, I think what I would call my single most influential decision. Okay. I'm going to put in two. I hope that's okay. I know that's tough. I'd say the core of where it comes from is an absolute passion to learn, to always learn. I think that fuels everything I do. And if I'm in a position where I'm not learning or I'm with people where I'm not, you know, I'm always pushing myself to learn more. So that kind of fuels every opportunity I choose, that that fuels who I work with, that fuels where I'm working. Um, so that ha- has been, I think, a big guiding string throughout my career. I'd say the biggest uh, the biggest and most influential decision I made was really that decision to, you know, um, leave CPG marketing and take my skills and and go to the not-for-profit. Um, and I'd say that really came from when I had my first child and being able to step back and take a, a bigger view of not just what I was doing every day, but where my skills could have the most impact um, and where I could really work on a scale that would make the biggest difference. Um, and, and I found that, you know, since I've done that, not a, I'm still working with extremely smart people. I'm using my strategic capabilities. I'm using my marketing capabilities, um, but I'm making a difference in a way that for me feels so fulfilling and so just, you know, just, I feel like I'm using my life to a purpose that I'm not sure I would have gotten to had I not made that decision. So to me, that's been, that's been, I think the biggest thing that's fueled my, fueled my career so far. Oh, that's incredible. And and if you could go back to yourself at the start of your career or early in your career and offer up one piece of advice, what would that be? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know, this might sound a bit and just controversial, but I would say don't have a five-year plan. Um, I think a lot, like at least when I started well, my career. All of the planners of- out there in the audience are like putting their pencils down and going, wait, what? 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 <laughs> Right. And, you know, I remember, especially when I started, it was such a thing. What's your five year plan? What's your goal? You better know where you would want to go. Otherwise, you're never going to get there. And I was so panicked and I would come up with these plans and I'd sit in these meetings with my CPG directors and VPs and they'd say, where do you want to go? And I would say, well, I want to be director of VP because that's what they wanted to hear because that was the trajectory they had. But Mm. I knew in my heart of hearts, even then, that's not what I wanted. Um, but that was what I had to say. So, you know, I think looking back, what I would say is if I had focused on my strengths and my passions, what I want and what I didn't want. So I know I want a learning environment. I know I need to work with really smart people in a warm culture. I know I need to be purpose led. That to me has led to much more opportunity and possibility than having a narrow plan. And I would say now, so many years later, a five year plan is almost kind of anathema to where we are. Like, dude, you know, look at what has just happened with the world. Who knows what opportunities are going to be available in five years? Um, Even if, you know, looking at COVID, yes, but looking at AI and tech, there's so many areas, jobs I couldn't even have imagined. And I have found that slightly tweaking, you know, I was in a marketing, that I was in strategy before, that I was in PR, I was in government affairs, having all these skills and slightly tweaking them has led me to a place where I have a lot of different backgrounds. And that helps me, you know, gives me a, a much wider lens into whatever I decide to do next. Um, and I found it for me a much more rewarding path than sort of just doing the one, you know, one straight goal. Um, so, and I, you know, continue to do that ease, even as I entrench in my career and looking for sort of what are other challenges I can embrace and what will grow other pieces of me? And so I would say that to myself and I would say that to other young, you know, uh, marketers and just professionals, you know, know what you're good at, have a good filter. It's just what I was saying about framework, strategic objectives. 
Mm -hmm. Know what your overall goal is and know where your strengths are, and where your weaknesses are um, or development areas are. But don't focus in too tight because then that does sort of you might close your eyes to opportunity that's in front of you. Yeah, it, it's, it really uh, it, it focuses on looking inward and knowing yourself and then having kind of a tight, loose framework, right? Yes, yes, exactly. I, I, it's back to the sandbox. Know the sandbox, but don't, don't pick your castle yet. I love it. Um, and then what's, what's exciting for you right now as you look out into the future? Like what, are you, what do you see as some of the big opportunities? Oh, that's a great question. Um, Well, I would say, as I said, I think COVID has really been a time to grow for us. There's a lot more opportunity and lots of things I'm looking at with different lenses, you know. So um, when I'm looking at, you know, just the way we're communicating um, our our relevance with Canadians. So, you know, I've talked a lot about the marketing side, but I also handle communications for our MHC. So the way we're communicating our case for support and what's important Canadians' values have really changed over the last year. I wouldn't say have changed, but have refined a bit and have, uh, different things have come into focus. So focusing on on sort of that piece and how our main sees an essential service um, and helps families is really not a place we've played in before. We've really been focused on understanding and awareness. So being able to strengthen that has been really important. Um, diversity and inclusion is extremely important to me. So, you know, you know, really in 2020, there's been, 2020, 2021, it was such a such an awful year, but has led to such, I think, an opportunity for lasting change. So being able to work with Canadian Marketing Association on their diversity and inclusion initiatives, really looking at how, you know, how that can be better woven through the marketing sector, what representation looks like, what access looks like, um, has become really, really important to me. Um, so again, as I said, draw, growing, growing kind of other areas. Um, based on, you know, where where the world is going. Um, so I'm really excited, honestly, when I look out and just see all the opportunities that have opened up. Now, there's with the opportunities, of course, as, as you said, maybe as restriction in, in the amount of resources you have. So you have to be even more crystal clear on how you want to move forward. But I think the silver lining is there are more there are places we can go now that we, we know a lot of charities weren't able to go before. So uh, I'm really excited to explore some of those. Wonderful. So great to chat. I mean, amazing uh, impact, you know, in this, in this, uh, in this conversation and in what you're doing right now. And thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much, Tony. I really enjoyed, enjoyed uh, speaking with you. Fantastic. Great. Talk to you soon. Sounds great. Thank you. 